Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Hey, it's Alex Bennett. It's the Ramble. We go till midnight Eastern Daylight Time. Yes, and if uh, that uh, fits in with your scheme right now, wherever you are in the world, then we are live. Except for now, because, well, we're going to be pre-recorded. Listen. Okay, let's try another one. Another one is uh, Larry Bubbles Brown. Hello, Larry. Hello, Alex. Larry Bubbles Brown is, of course, a comedian of little renown and uh, medium skills. And uh, <laughs> you, you nailed it. <laughs> and he's decided to make a living for all of his life off of being a comedian, uh, which is he would have done better by, I don't know, working at Costco. Anyway, or, yeah, I should have stayed in my payroll job in the federal government. I would have had a retirement. You know, the problem with you, and I've often said this about you, Larry, is uh, you're not aggressive. No, you know? not at all. Uh, I, some comedians get up in the morning, and the only job they feel they have is to fill the calendar, right? And they're right. calling every club. I, I, they I wait for the phone to ring. <laughs> you wait for the phone to ring. And luckily for you, you're good enough that the phone does ring. Occasionally. Yes. Occasionally. And you've got some people who like using you as an opener because they don't want anybody who can top them. And uh, that or they pity me. <laughs> no, you open for uh, for uh, uh, Dana Carvey. Dana Carvey, uh, Felipe yeah. Esparza, who you probably don't know, who's getting very big right now. And, 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 and you're a good opening act for, for almost anybody, you know. I think I used you a lot as an opening act. You did, yeah. You know what I did? I ran these shows where we would run, what, how many comedians through the door at one time? Uh, uh, six or seven. Yeah, six or seven. Uh, Those are great shows, too. Yeah. And, and, and I think six on a show. And what I would do is I had, uh, most people who do a show would put the worst comedian on first, you know, or the newest comedian on first, and then the next best second, and third, and fourth, and so on. Uh, and um, my theory was you put the second best comedian you have first because you want the show to start off good. It, it sets a tone, which is something the yeah. clubs have never really... They, they always have the MC, who's the newest, most insecure comic who usually doesn't do well, and uh, that's how they always start shows, and you were right, because you, you want to set a tone for the show and get a, somebody really good out there. Yeah. When you have someone that starts the show, they're not that good, the people think, oh, we made a mistake. So I always put what I considered the second best comic I had first. One time I had Warren Thomas. I had him on with somebody else, and he was what I considered the second hottest comedian. I mean, there's always one guy you hire who expects to be the headliner, right? Yeah. And that's why you hired him anyway. So I I, I put, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, oh, God. Warren, Warren Thomas uh, on first. And he said, why are you putting me on first? I'm not that bad. I said, no, I'm putting you on first because you're that good. Yeah, and, that's the comics always had that reaction. Why <laughs> do they thought yeah. they were being demoted. I, I need being... somebody hot to start the show, okay? And then the second and uh, uh, fourth, uh, the second spot uh, was always, uh, you know, it could, it could go either way. Oh, boy. We just lost him. Let me call him back. Uh, here we go. Let's see if it rings. There we go. Boy, we, okay, we yeah. lost you there for a second. Okay. Anyway, I, I I would always you know the second one you could go in any way with okay, but the third one I put the weakest person in the middle. Mm hmm. And the, the weakest person always felt he was better because I put him in the middle. <laughs> uh, you know, one time Feldman came to me. He said, uh, "So uh, I'm I'm going on third. I said, "Why?" He says, "He says uh, why." I said, have I gotten that good? I said, no, you've gotten that bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But then I, you know, then you had the headliner. But you know that whole concept that you put the worst comedian on first. No, you put the second best comedian you got on first, so that you right. you're off to a good start, right? So exactly. if somebody sucks in the middle, it doesn't matter, you know. So uh, start, you start strong and finish. Strong. It, it was always difficult for me though because I always hired people I thought were good. I would never put people on my show that I didn't. No, the, those shows like. were uh, those were really fun. Those were great shows. Yeah, and I think yeah. you did a lot of them. I did a lot of them, and the uh, I think that show, I didn't do the one you did at Circle Star. But that's I people talk about that show to this day. It was uh, it was Warren Rubin, Dana, Dana Carvey, and Goldthwait, and uh, yeah, well, it was called the Bobcat Goes to Hollywood. Yeah, uh, it that was, apparently was uh, on fire that night. Everybody. It was a goodbye show for Bobcat Goldthwait when he was going to do uh, Police Academy. Police Academy, yeah. And uh, so we called The Bobcat Goes to Hollywood, did it at the Circle Star Theater, sold it out. Uh, and it was uh, Dana Carvey, and it was Bob Rubin, and uh, who was uh, who's the, Warren. And Warren Thomas, yeah. 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 Uh, and that was a good show. It was a very good show. You know. and I think that was the one where I put Warren on first, and he said, why are you putting me on first? And I said, because, you, you know, I consider you... A, a, a strong talent. I need a strong talent to start the show off. Yeah. Uh, and I think I, I think I put Ruben on second because I didn't want him to go on bef before Goldthwaite because they both had the same kind of tone. Mm -hmm. They were loud comedians. And if you have a loud <laughs> comedian followed by a loud comedian, the second comedian who's loud has a harder time of getting the audience. <laughs> So Dana was perfect for the third spot because he has kind of a laid back, cute, you know, kind of demeanor, which is deceptive because he's a very edgy comedian. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he, um, he he did uh, uh, he did that uh, that spot, and it was uh, it was a, it was a very good show. It was a very good show. I still have videotape of backstage at that show. Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, those are the days when I got along with Goldthwait. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a nice relationship. Made me a lot of money. I made him a lot of money. Mm-hmm. You know, so anyway. Well, he's had a in, kind of an interesting career. It, it really, it, I've often said about Goldthwait, I try to figure out, has he had a good career or hasn't he had a good career? And my answer to that question is, I don't. I think he's had kind of a mediocre career. You know, he's always been in there doing something, making movies, directing films. Has a right now he's got a TV show on. I don't know, Animal Planet. What? what uh, True TV. That's where it is. I mean, who the fuck does a show for True TV uh, except something that's like, you know? But anyway. He's always been kind of in there, and he's always working, but I don't think he's that success. Would you call him a success? I always thought he'd be at a higher level than he got to, you know. Yeah. I think he alienated a lot of people, you know. I mean, the reason why uh, you can succeed in Hollywood and not be terribly talented is people like you, you know. I think the uh, like the, someone said the Cohen brothers use a lot of the same actors. It's because they're easy to get along with. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, but there's something to be said to being easy to get yeah, along. Yeah, yeah. And and he was not an easy person to get along with. At least when he finally went down to Hollywood. You know. Well, I don't think setting the couch on fire in the Tonight Show was probably a good move. <laughs> well, he didn't, also didn't set the world on fire when after he did the Police Academy movie. They offered him a contract. Do him, do a major film for us, right? So, mm -hmm. what was his big film? The Talking Horse film. Remember that? I yeah. can't remember what it was called now, but it was a horse film, and it was so bad, it was unbelievable. You know, uh, and and uh, he was screaming his way all the way through it, and uh, that pretty much killed his his career. He did some wow. movie with Whoopi Goldberg where she was a detective. That's, uh, I was trying to think he did something with Whoopi Goldberg. What one was that? Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it now. 
But uh, that was not a particularly great film for Whoopi, you know. And uh, uh, in fact, I think that was, was that prior to her doing, no, Color Purple was her first big movie. So, you know. Uh, the only, the, you know what her best role was? Uh, the time she played me on Comedy Tonight. Uh, I say that because they replaced me with her as the host of Comedy oh, Tonight. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I always say that Whoopi Goldberg went on to portray me on Comedy Tonight. <laughs> she was always a nice lady. Yeah, yeah, she was, seemed uh, nice. She, uh, God, I think she's probably made a fortune. But yeah, but I, uh, you know, I, um, I met up with her. The next time I met up with her was at Goldthwaite's wedding in San Francisco uh, to his first wife. Uh, and um, I was at, she was at the wedding. And, and uh, so we started talking, and I said, you know, when you get a chance, I'd love to have you on the show again. And she said, uh, yeah, I'd love to do the show again if I, uh, if I ever get successful. <laughs> if I'm ever successful really? enough to be on your show. And I went, come on, you're doing great. She says, every every movie's the last one. You know? Uh, movie actors have uh, that I've interviewed have said this a lot, that when they sign out of a movie, because they always have to sign some papers, it's the end of the movie. Uh, uh, it, it, when you sign out at the end of the movie, uh, you, you don't know if that's going to be the last film you're ever going to do. Yeah, I, I was talking to some actor. He said, "Everyone tells you how great you were, then you never hear from anyone again. Then you never work again. Yeah, <laughs> right. and you wonder why. What did I do? What's what's wrong? What's my problem here? You know? Uh, but uh, who was it? Oh, yeah, Patrick Stewart. I remember this. Patrick Stewart was on my show at Sirius, and uh, um, uh, after it was over." Um, uh, I said, I hope you'll come back and see us again. And he said, well, I will if I still have a career. <laughs> right. and, and, and again, here was another guy. Now, you, you imagine Patrick Stewart saying to you, if I still have a career. And this was after Star Trek and after he'd done a lot of movies. I mean, this was just a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, that's uh, not a beginner. God. Uh, he always had the feeling that the, that next movie was going to be his last. You know? Uh, so, so a lot of actors are that insecure. That's how bad the business is. You know, they got that insecure that they uh, uh, that they didn't think that there was another movie they were going to ever be doing. So you know, so come by and see us when next time you do something. Uh, well, who knows if I'll ever be doing anything ever again? I've had a lot of movie people say that to me. Um, yeah, it's odd that the business, uh, at the most insecure people in the world go into a business. <laughs> well, how about the most insecure people go into comedy? I mean, what yeah. a terrible business to go into if you have a, if you have a, if you're insecure. You're asking for the adulation of an audience every time you go on stage. And when you don't get it, if you've got bad, uh, you know, uh, bad self-image. That's a killer. Yeah, Dana Carvey told me that. He said when he started, he was just a nervous wreck. He said, I can't believe I actually was attracted to the business. I don't know why I got into it. It was horrible. And Well, if you have low self-esteem, uh, you know, uh, you, you, it's just not it, it, why you would do comedy. I have no idea. And yet, people with low self-esteem are drawn to comedy. We're the hookers of uh, show business. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> right. And if an audience applauds, it, 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 you feel so great. But if they don't, how, you've done you've done shitty performances, right? <laughs> More than I care to remember. I mean, where yet. you went out and you literally bombed, right? Uh huh. Tell me how you felt afterwards. I when I first started, it was a uh, it was about as close to death as you can feel. Really? As you get as you get older and you do this for a few years, you bomb. You still feel really bad that you forget about it the next day. But I remember the the first year of comedy when you bomb, it was just like, oh, you carry that for weeks. I have an idea. You should do a, a biography of yourself, an autobiography, and title it "Used to Bombing." <laughs> 
I imagine you get used to being a, a failure. You do. You just blow it off. It, it does take a. It takes about a day to blow it out of your system, where it's like a, a month. To, and you're Why do we use such violent terms when you do well? Like, I really killed them. Killed them, slayed them, punchline. Yeah, five. I think comedy is very, uh, it, there's... Yeah. Someone on the uh, Gary Shandling show, someone say, in stand-up comedy, there's a underlying current of violence. Y you're probably right. You're probably right. Um, there's also, in just comedy in general is mean uh, it is mean yeah and a lot of comics are actually openly mean uh, uh, you know a guy in a, in a slapstick comedy slips on a banana peel you laugh but really if in real life somebody slipped on a banana peel you go <laughs> are you okay <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know a pie in the face if somebody threw a pie in your face in normal life you go what who who just assaulted you Right? But in a movie, uh -huh. oh, hey, that's hilarious. Oh, look, he's taking the pie and he's wiping it out of his eyes. You know. Uh, the nature of... Well, I've got... Uh, there's a guy that won Jeopardy. The guy that set the record... Uh, I forget how... He won a few million dollars. Uh, Ken Jennings. He, Ken Jennings. He is Ken Jennings. He's, can, he's written a book di dissecting stand-up comedy. I want to read that. But then someone told me he really goes into it and kind of explains how it works and how, why it works how it works yeah 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 but why he did a book on comedy he wrote a book yeah who seemed he seemed like not the most humorous guy but <laughs> yeah why would he write a book on comedy i heard um, it's really good someone told me yeah it really uh, breaks it down see, i've never thought about writing a book on comedy or you know doing a, a treatise on comedy i i just think it's something it, something's either funny or it isn't that's it, you know. And if, if you, you got to break it down, it's not funny. Like, like comedy is your job, right? Mm -hmm. When you go on stage, if you're trying to be funny and you're not, guess what? You're not doing your job. I know. <laughs> you know. So anyway, hey, listen. Let me ask you this: uh, When you were growing up. When was the first time you realized that movies were more than just an entertainment? In other words, you saw a movie that had a profound effect on you. I think uh, maybe it was, uh, God, I loved Jerry Lewis. And I think maybe, I was kind of a loner kid and kind of sad, so yeah. when I'd go to his movies, I'd laugh and feel good. Okay, so... It, it, but that, so so it's you, not, not exactly life-saving, but I mean it... Uh, Maybe kept me from getting more depressed. I'll tell you something. The same thing happened to me with the Jerry Lewis movie too. Uh, oh I, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. That's right. Exactly. I uh, I I got to my girlfriend pregnant, and uh, she decided that she didn't want to marry me and raise the kid with me, and was going to give it up for adoption. And that night, I was as suicidal as I think I've ever been in my life. You know, there was it, just this. This mental pain you had where you just, no matter what you did, you could get under the covers and it was there with you, you know? You could drive as fast down the road and it was still right in the car with you. Yeah. You know you, you know what I'm talking about. That, that, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that kind of amazing depression and, and that it was the closest I think I ever came to being suicidal as a result. And I was passing by the uh, Marin Theater in Sausalito. And I looked, and there was a Jerry Lewis movie playing. I originally thought it was The Nutty Professor, but now when I think about the year that it happened, it probably was Cinder Fellow, which is not one of Jerry Lewis's best films, okay? No. And uh, I went into the theater. I just decided to hell with it. You know, Maybe a movie will take my mind off of it. And I'm watching this movie, and all of a sudden, I found myself laughing. And... It was at that precise moment that I began to realize why I wanted to be in show business. That maybe there's somebody out there who needs a little light moment to take them away from what's happening mm -hmm. in their lives. And you know, maybe I can be that guy. I can be that good. 
Uh, and uh, so that was, that was when I first realized the value of being funny. That, um, you know, there was a value to being funny. And that it shouldn't be looked down upon, it should be revered. Because being funny really makes somebody else's life better. Am I, am I offbeat on this? Am I being too... No, absolutely. I think it can be, uh, well, in your case, it might have been life-saving. In my case, it was life-saving. Um, and, and, and by the way, that's not his best movie. And by the way, Jerry Lewis was a comedian who I came to kind of like dislike, not like, you know. But, yeah, definitely a lot of negatives. <laughs> well, no, early in the, early in the day, he was terrific. I think the Nutty Professor is as good a comedy as you're going to find anywhere. You know, oh, love it, love it. But by the time you get to the Aaron Boy and crap like that, you know, he's there are moments. But uh, those movies, there's those are bad movies. It's uh, they still have there'll be three or four really funny moments in there. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, but. Um, you know, it, 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 when he was with Dean Martin, there was nothing better than that team. I mean, they were just incredible. Uh, but um, They were the comic version of the Beatles. Oh, without question. I, I have a video I played on this show of them outside, uh, you know, it, uh, looking out their window at the Paramount Theater in New York. And the crowds down there, you would think if I had just done away with the picture of them in the window and just shown the crowds, you'd think it was people yelling at them, waving at the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they were that kind of sensation. Uh, and uh, that's got to be really rough, though, you know, being that kind I of... I think he was 21 then, which is, uh, I can't imagine. <laughs> Martin was a little older and had a little... Martin was about 10 years older, yeah. And had a little more of a grasp on life, you know, and what it was all about. Uh, but uh, uh, for for Jerry Lewis, that was you know to begin with, uh, he probably had a a certain propensity towards being a prick. That only made him a bigger prick. Yeah, uh, you know. So I mean, uh, it, it, but they were they were he, they were incredible together. They were just incredible together. And I'm not talking about the movies, although the movies they were funny. But on stage, they were, if you, you go back, if people get a chance, go look up the Colgate Comedy Hours, where they would literally, at the end of every show, do their stage act. Then you would see what I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. They referred to it as the uh, organ grinder and his chimp. That's how they referred <laughs> to good their act. <laughs> you know, that was, that was the way they described it. And it, it's kind of true. I mean, it really is an organ grinder and his chimp. Uh, but when, when I was talking about movies that made you realize that movies could be more than that, and you, you talked about Jerry Lewis making you feel laugh when you were growing up and you didn't feel like laughing very much. Uh, yeah. With me, the movie that did it was, I, uh, and I was about 17 at the time, I went to a theater that was showing a revival of a, of a film that I had heard about, and I figured I'd go see and I went to see it. I think it was in Sacramento, oddly enough. It was playing at a theater. And I went with a girlfriend I was going with in Sacramento. And uh, it was Citizen Kane. And I watched this film. And when it was over, I said, gee, movies can be something than just, you know, detective solving the crime or a comedian making funny jokes or whatever. That it can really have an impact on you. Uh, and and that was the first film that made me realize that films could be an art form. That we like to say. say I had the same feeling about Citizen Kane myself. Yeah, yeah. To the point where I saw it like about I saw it over fifty times. Over fifty times. There's some. There's something that move. It's, it's got such a mood. It just draws you in. I I was just fascinated with it. Wow. There's well. There's some movies that. If they're on and you catch them in the middle, you just keep watching them. Yeah. Uh, Casablanca was that way. Most people can't tell you what the beginning of Casablanca is like, which is a picture of the earth and some narration saying, in Casablanca, blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> you know, you don't remember that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the Maltese Falcon, I always have this trivia question. Trivia question time for Bubs as we go into the last minutes of our 
little repartee here. What is the last line in the Maltese Falcon? Oh, crap, I know this. Uh, I know it, but I can't draw it up. Well, you're going to think that it's probably uh, uh, Humphrey Bogart saying uh, it's the things that dreams are made of, right? Yeah. But the last Wait, line is actually from Ward Bond, who looks at him and goes, huh? <laughs> so if anybody ever asks you what are the last line of, Cas <laughs> of the Maltese Falcon is, it's, huh? Hey, Larry, good talking to you again. Good talking to you, Alex. Once again, another one of those Larry Brown specials here on the uh, Ramble. Electrifying radio. <laughs> Electrifying radio. Thank you, bubs. Thanks, Alex. Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I, 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 the end of that uh, interview snuck up on me, and I uh, didn't, uh, didn't go to my promo uh, fast enough. And then I had to suddenly realize the light in the back on the air wasn't on. That's bad, too, because a girlfriend gave me that light. And if I don't light it up, uh, she's all over me the next day. So, um, you know, I'm, yes, I'm pussy whipped. Okay? Uh, plain and simple. I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, how are you? Uh, I'm going to open the Skype lines here in a moment. The questionable Skype lines. I, I, last night, uh, because I have the new version installed in this machine, and then I uninstalled it last night. And then I tried to reinstall it side by side with the other one, and it wouldn't do that because when you would uh, install one, it would uh, defeat the other and so on. So the one I have up tonight is the one that we use and the one you use to call into. Uh, and uh, that is what is called Skype 7. And there seems to be a big brouhaha going on as regards uh, that uh, um, uh, number uh, 8, which they ha are trying to force on you, which is just god-awful. And, you know, I wish I hated it because I'm an old fart and I just can't get used to something new and better. But hey, you know, I don't mind something new and better. Uh, I just mind something that's new and worse than you had before, which seems to be what Microsoft does best. They own Skype, by the way. Uh, they seem to do that best. I mean, anybody who's ever had, uh, well, they got it right with Windows 10, I think, finally. But Windows 7 was a disaster. Windows 8 was a disaster. Uh, and they, they sit around, uh, you know. The trouble is these guys that create these things. By the way, our lines are open in case you want to call. And it's a fill-free night tonight. So let that be a lesson to you. Um, that these people who make up these programs and create them uh, sit around and pat each other on the back. Oh, look what I got it to do. And look what I got it to do. And this is terrific. But they don't think about you and me and how we use it, okay? Nobody came to me and said, hey, Alex, we hear you use Skype for citizen panels. Uh, what's the problem with the new Skype uh, 8? What do you see as a problem? And I would say, well, it's that I can't easily bring the screen that goes out, the screen of the, uh, of the show, uh, to, uh, to people. Uh, and, and I, it, there is a way of doing it now, but it's by using a third-party program, which is called Nutex NDI. Nutex is a company, by the way, who ha happened over years to be good friends of mine. They were the people that created uh, the, uh, 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 the video toaster and uh, a whole bunch of things, and uh, the TriCaster, which I wound up using when we were doing our program originally as a TV show uh, for my friend's TV studio, and they had the TriCaster in there. But anyway, uh, they came up with this thing that, that goes on and takes the screen you've got on Skype, 
and allows you to use the screen through this program. And once you get it working, it's, it's okay. Uh, it works fine, but it takes a lot to get it all up. You have to have your dot, uh, T's crossed and your I's dotted and all the switches in the right place, and then it will work. And I guess I could get it to work every night, but then once I get it to work, what have I got? I've got the new Skype. And what the Skype, new Skype, if you watch this show for any amount of time, see that every time we get a new person online, another person fills up, and we can put about 10 people all on the screen at the same time. Uh, with Skype 8, we'll never be able to do that because Skype 8 only puts four people on the screen at a time, and if you want to have somebody on the screen, you have to move, they have a bubble, right, with their live representation in the bubble along the top, and you have to drab, drag and drop it down. Well, that, you know, that's more work for me. I like to sit here, and then once people start calling, uh, I like to be able to sit back and talk with them and argue and not have to pay much attention to, to that sort of thing. But here I'll be constantly working at getting, like if, if all of a sudden uh, Phil wants to talk and he hasn't, oh, let's say Tony wants to talk and he hasn't talked in a while, I then have to drag him down into the screen and lose somebody else because they only fit four people on the screen at a time. It's disgusting. And they don't say, hey, well, would you like the old kind of configuration that you're used to where you can put 10 people on the screen at the same time and give us a choice? But no, they didn't build that into it because the guys back in Microsoft don't have to use this uh, for the purposes that we use it. Is anybody going to call, by the way? I'm just wondering. It's just a little question I have to ask. Uh, by the way, tomorrow night I'm going to show... Uh, I'm going to show uh, a video I put together of my weekend up in Vermont, and it's not exciting, okay? It's not exciting, but it, it'll fill up 18 minutes. Uh, and I, I put it together today. I shot the whole thing on an iPhone, and um, shot it on the iPhone, and that worked out pretty good, uh, you know, in 4K. The only thing is, for some reason, it didn't make the file, the final file that I put together in 4K, and I don't know why. So I have to go back and check that one out. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it, it looks great. It looks terrific. And um, uh, while I do like shooting with the iPhone and uh, uh, it looks terrific and looks good, uh, it does have problems when it comes to production. For instance, let's say I go to Europe on a vacation and I want to use the iPhone to shoot the vacation with. Well, that's fine. I've got enough uh, um, um, power in the machine, in the phone, to really do the whole trip and have all the files on the phone. That's not the problem. Uh, the problem is, is that Number one, I have to turn off it going up to the cloud because let's say I'm in Europe, if it has to go to the cloud constantly and deliver with the video I shot that day, number one, I'm gonna use up a hell of a lot of space up on the cloud, which is gonna cost me extra money. And on top of that, um, uh, it may cost me money in, uh, in, in bandwidth in sending stuff up when I'm, say, in another country, okay? So I have to turn that off so that it only records it to the phone and that's it. Now yesterday, I had to come home, take all the stuff that was on the phone and uh, 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 tell it to uh, offload it onto my, uh, onto my computer, which was fine. That was, that was good. The only thing is that took quite a while, all right? And then I wanted to take all those files that finally went over into a, a, another file and put them into a folder on my desktop. Well, I had something like, I can't remember how many files I had, something like 90 files. And it took it two hours, three hours to get it over into that folder. I mean, that, that's how slow it was. So I'm wondering if I come back and I've got 500 files because I was in Europe and I was shooting everything, you know, 
uh, will I be able, you know, I, I, I probably will have to, you know, say, okay, put these over on that uh, drive and they'll put them over on that drive and on the, or in the folder and I can come back three days later and they'll probably just be finishing up. So the problem of doing it from the iPhone is uh, there are many problems associated with it. So I might still have to get myself a regular camera. And uploading GoPro files, a little faster, not as, as bad, but certainly not, not that good. Well, here comes somebody who wants to talk to me tonight. And it's always a guy I can depend on, ladies and gentlemen, Tom Yamaguchi. Hey, what's going on? Does anybody ever call you the Gooch? Um, uh, no, uh, people used to call me Tamaguchi. Tamaguchi. Uh, and, uh. Wasn't there a little toy or something? That, wasn't there that, that, that? Matter of fact, I was, I was thinking of this story. Um, uh, when, uh, what's going on with my computer? Anyway, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, great. Uh. When you went on to CNET, and yeah. I discovered you on CNET, yeah. uh, I was able to listen during you know, like the last half hour of your show because I went on a lunch break. Yeah. And then uh, I one day, you were talking about the Tamagotchis, and you were calling them Tamaguchis. Oh, really? I know. I wonder if he still remembers me. Now, if, if people don't know what we're talking about, it was a little toy. It was about this this size, okay, if you're li watching us, if you're listening to us on our uh, uh, audio stream, then screw you. You're not going to see how big a Tom Yamaguchi or Tamaguchi was. But oh, uh, uh, it was about that big, and it was uh, a little thing, and you had to do things like feed it. Right. But you didn't actually feed it food. It. If, you, it, if, if you didn't, it died. Yes, it did die. It was a toy that would die on you if you didn't feed it or take care of it or give it enough love. And uh, it, in the beginning, it was fun, but it becomes so needy that your whole life is centered around this little thing you're carrying around that goes, feed me, I'm hungry, you know. Yeah. So, so I, I called you up because I guess... You know, I thought, well, hey, is it interesting you? Because, because I used to send you email. Yeah. And just so that you sort of like got to know my last name through email. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had remembered me after all these years, and turned out you did. Yeah, well, of course <laughs> I did. How can I forget a name like Tommy Yamaguchi? That's true. That's, um, that's the nice thing about being adopted with an interesting yeah. name is people remember you. The problem is I don't remember other people, so it's yeah. sort of embarrassing. Well, uh, uh, are there any? Uh, you're you're always the guy who tells us about death and about p people who died. Okay. Yeah, I've been out of it for today, so I don't yeah. know what's going on for today. Well, have you heard who died? Well, of course, a lot of people. No, died. I, I I just got home. I just got home, so this I, was uh, actually this was this came through when did it when I get this October second, so this came through yesterday. Just didn't read it last night. The woman who was the inspiration for the nineteen fifty eight Buddy Holly Peggy Sue song has died. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, the AP reports that Peggy Sue Gernon Rackham of Lubbock, Texas, died uh, Monday. At University Medical Center in Lubbock, she was 78. Well, that makes me feel good. Uh, <laughs> can't they die at 79, 76? No, they died at 78. Okay. Uh, Peggy Sue Guerin in uh, 2008 released her autobiography, Whatever Happened to Peggy Sue, a memoir of Buddy Holly's Peggy Sue to mark the 50th anniversary of the song. Uh, while promoting her autobiography, she said material for the memoir came from about 150 diaries made during the time she knew Holly. Garen was born in Olton, Texas, but moved to Lubbock where she attended high school and met Holly and his friends. I wanted to give him, Holly, his voice. It's my book, my memoirs. We were very, very good friends, and he was probably one of the best friends I ever had. She married, guess who she married? Jerry Allison the drummer for the Hollies. 
for the crickets, rather. The crickets. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the, cu- the couple. Huh? <laughs> Grab Nash. The couple was later divorced. Uh, the song was originally be- supposed to be called Cindy Lou after Holly's niece, but the story goes that Allison wanted to impress Peggy Sue, so he convinced Holly to change the name. Wow. Holly later wrote a song sequel, Peggy Sue Got Married. Which, uh, oh. Yes. Oh, okay. Because yeah. that's also the, the uh, name of a uh, Francis Ford Coppola movie. Yes. But oh, I, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that that I, was connected. I, I, I remember pe- the song Peggy Sue Got Married. Uh, it was like, you know, they, it, 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 a lot of times these guys in those days would write sequel songs. You know, yes, uh, Hank right. Ballard wrote right. to Annie. Right. Uh, Annie had a uh, uh, Annie work with had, the hair, work with work, the head work with me, Annie, and then he and did Annie had a baby. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, right. and, and uh, his stuff was always dirty. I mean, work with me, Annie. What does work with me, Annie, mean? You know exactly. <laughs> and and the line about that, well, the line in work with me, Annie, is that's what. Oh no, no, and, uh, Annie had a baby. There's a line. That's what happen when happens when the getting gets good. Right. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. All right. Anyway, are, are, is it just going to be you and I for the next? Uh... Yeah, I, I know. I, I joined late. Uh, I was sort of like I had to answer the door because yeah. <laughs> because uh, one of my housemates had a guest and I was entertaining him for a few minutes. And then I came back and you were giving this little monologue yeah. and. I says, oh, what's going on? Is the Skype broken? <laughs> no, the Skype is working just fine, folks. Oh, wow. Anyway. Wow. I know it was last night. That was really annoying. What? The, the you know, the, oh, the, that, double, that ringing. the yeah. double answering. Yeah, well, that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a little. I could have, if I'd known the program better, but it, it, it's not a great program, this Skype 8. There is a place that says sign out, but I oh. didn't see it. And uh, the only way I could get rid of it was just by killing, just removing the whole goddamn thing. It was just, it was insane. Just yeah. insane. These people yeah. are driving me nuts. They have a, a site where people, it's called answers.skype.com or something like that. And uh, people go there complaining about mm. Skype. And I got to tell you, there must be a thousand of them. I mean, people just hate Skype 8. They just hate it. Now, I don't know. Maybe you use Skype 8 now, I would imagine. I'm using you know, I mean, you know, yeah, I know it should be with little circles. Yeah. I can imagine why you would not want that on the... Um Right on the on the broadcast or the, or the stream. But streams. also, also the program itself. You know, when you do a program, you want to make it as intuitive as possible. In other words, that somebody who doesn't know computers much can just click on Skype and use it. And mm-hmm. I got to tell you, the Skype we've been using all along is pretty simple to use. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, all you got to know is how to turn it on. And just sit there and wait for somebody to call, like I am right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, it it um, you know it it's it's pretty uh, it, it it's pretty amazing, but you know we don't have Phil here tonight, and I like to think that whenever Phil isn't here, you call. So I think if you use our substitute Phil, I you know. Uh, <laughs> Even though the nope. two of you have nope. no have nope. don't don't have nope. politics that even come close to each other. No, no tech talk. Let I'm me. not going to talk about camera lenses. I'm oh. not going to talk about mixing boards. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> All that boring shit. Yeah. Uh, or a legacy, a, a a rendition of "Here's what I bought recently." Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But he does send me his cast-offs. That's that's the good part of it. I have I have a huge control board sitting in the other room that I can't find any place to put it. It's so big. So I I don't know if I'll use. But he shipped it to me, and he sold me his Mac Mini for three hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. It promptly broke on me and cost me four hundred bucks to fix it. But <laughs> it's a thirteen fourteen hundred dollar Mac Mini, and it, it really is peppy and zippy. I love it. If you're listening, uh-huh. Phil, I do love it. Yes, 
Anyway, I, anyway, I, I have been, you know, we've been talking for a long time here about uh, what's going on with this whole Me Too movement and all the, all the, the, the well, how could we call it, uh, uh, not tragedies, but all the, uh, all the bodies strewn along the road uh, from this thing who have been fired or let go because their behavior was not living up to the current fad. And I call it a fad because we'll move on to something else. You know, something else will suddenly become de classe. And unfortunately, we will maybe forget about this. But right now, anybody who's caught up in this web, especially the ones who were early on, are really in trouble. I mean, you're never going to see Kevin Spacey in a movie again. You're never going to... Weinstein is never going to get to produce films any longer. And these people are horrible people, and they deserve what they got. Okay? On the other hand, I think they're... Are, are people like my friend, uh, the, the comedian, uh, Louis C.K., who I think, you know, come on. You know, I've known Louis. He's a pretty decent guy. Uh, maybe he did, maybe he thought that was funny. You know, it didn't, it, it, but he he admitted to it. That was the thing that was wrong. You know, you would think if people admit to it and say, I'm sorry, I know better now, I'll never do it again, you go, Good. You apologize. You will move on with your life. But no, you can't apologize. They just all they do is say, "See, he admitted it." You know. So, uh, redemption is not something we believe in in this particular case. But up until now, and I, I knew Louis C.K. peripherally, so I, I knew him, okay. And I knew, uh, uh, and, but I haven't known anybody else that's been caught up in this web. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I can't think of anybody that I'm, until today. Um, I have a friend. I met him. I met him through Shecky, but he, he he wanted to meet me because he had listened to me when he was growing up and stuff. And his name is Vinny Favalli. Vinny's a great guy. Everybody everybody loves Vinny. Uh, how can you not love a guy named Vinny? But uh, he was uh, among other things. He was the representative of CBS uh, in charge of overseeing late night on CBS. So he was the liaison between CBS and, oh. and whatever for the Letterman show. Uh, for, okay, for so the, that's how for your the, friend Shecky does. For the Late Late Show, yeah. For the Late Late Show, uh, he was one of the guys who started Comedy Central. Uh, and it's been my privilege to know him over the years. Uh, and um, he, uh, uh, in fact, when I was looking for a job, he gave me a couple of names, you know, and stuff like that to go talk to when I was still in California and out of work and looking for something here in New York. But anyway, uh, so uh, Vinny, it has just been reported, uh he he is now his title current title senior vice president for talent for CBS Television Studios was put on leave after multiple individuals made allegations about him. Uh, the report quote, quotes female former CBS executive telling CNN of Favali, "I'll never forget the day he told me he got four erections while watching Jennifer Hudson rehearse." Now remember, this guy was in charge of comedy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, and yes. and and I I can't help but believe that he would say something like that as a joke, you know, yeah. uh, and then you would think, yeah, I'll make a joke about that. Nobody's going to mind a joke about that, but then it comes back to haunt you when it's no longer a joke. You get what okay. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but anyway, Favali allegedly made the comment about Hudson as he watched the Oscar-winning performer rehearse ahead of a December 2015 appearance on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Two other CBS employees, one former and one current, told CNN they heard Favali say the vulgar remark. Others told CNN they learned about it from co-workers later that day. Of the five sources CNN spoke to about the incident, Two said Favali allegedly made the remark in the presence of a CBS Standards and Practices representative. Mm -hmm. 
Nine current and former CBS employees, including men and women, have reportedly agreed to be interviewed by CNN for the story. They spoke on condition of anonymity, citing non-disclosure agreements and concern about possible professional retribution. Following a uh, request by CNN for a comment from CBS, a spokesman for CBS reportedly said Favali was placed on administrative leave today. Favali denies the allegations of retaliation and said his comments were taken out of context. CNN adds, in the current role, Favali develops programming around talent and advises on comedy bookings for the network. He started his career with CBS in 1996. That's how many years? 20 years? He's been there 22 years. Yeah. And served as a senior programming executive for The Late Show with David Letterman and The Late Show with Stephen Colbert through 2017. He appeared on the program in comedic bits several times during Letterman's tenure. Uh, your thoughts? Do you have any thoughts about this? Well, uh, my thoughts are, you know, obviously there are, we're talking about different types of situations. I mean, when you compare it to something like what Kavanaugh is being accused of, I mean, it's, it is a lot different. Yes. Like, you just making, you know, I mean, this is sort of more like, this is more like what a, what uh, you know? Uh, what's his name on the Supreme Court? Uh, Clarence Thomas. Yeah. I mean, Clarence Thomas would make yeah little remarks like that too, according to Anita Hill. But then again, that wasn't Comedy Central. That was a law office. So, so it's difficult to 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 to, to say all to 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 make an equivalency of all this. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's also difficult to say, uh, well, we I know you talked last night about the uh, about uh, about Trump's um, reaction yeah. or his his performance last night, which was absolutely disgusting. Yeah. I mean that was just I uncalled know. for. Yeah. You know. Uh, and whatever you think of of you know her, you know her, her 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 case or whatever it is, that was just totally unacceptable. Well, especially from a guy who a few days earlier said that her uh, testimony was compelling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he turns around and says that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, well, I think I, I think what happens specifically with Trump is that you know he. I think his 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 Achilles heel is really these these uh, these rallies because they they pump him up and they really once he gets going he just loses control you know as much as they try to control him oh he's a loose cannon he the gets, minute he's up there with once the he, once 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 he gets into the into these rally situations then he's got the the crowds going and and. And, and not only that, I mean, it's just like, not only was his comments really, really, really offensive, but the audience reaction, they're laughing. They're laughing at what he was saying. You know, yeah. and I was just, I was just thinking of, you know, Dr. Ford is just, when she actually told Leahy what she remembered most was the laughing at, at, at her expense. And I go, how, how, could, how could you put somebody through that? It's a good that point is, you make. It's a very good that's point. awful. Yeah. That is just completely, completely awful. So I, I think, as I've addressed this before, I think the issue is, is we really need a, a way to, to, we need a different way of, 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 of dealing with 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 justice in this matter, mm -hmm. and I think what what we really need to be looking at is truth and reconciliation, just like in African countries, you know, like Somalia and all, where or South Africa, where I mean, really horrendous crimes have, have take place. I mean, people getting murdered, people getting tortured, and then after the war, saying, "There's got to be a way that we can put this behind us," and. And for people to step up and say, you know what, ha you know, there's got to be a way that 
we can make this right without, you know, without retribution. Mm-hmm. Because that's what we're all, you know, that's what basically, unfortunately, our, our justice system has been. It's just been retribution, punishment, re- you know. It's just like, instead of making things better, we seem to make things worse. Right. Right. You know, uh, you know? Uh, you know it, um, uh, it was sad. But, you know, getting back to Vinny, uh, I know Vinny. Uh, I don't know him that well. I know him well. Mm-hmm. But I don't know him that well. I know him even more through Shecky, who always talks about. It. I saw Vinny today. Vinny said blah blah blah. He says hello and so on. But you know, it's it's not that close a relationship. But I know the guy, and then the guy I know seems like a fairly decent guy to me. And it's not like he in these in these uh, things they're accusing him of. He patted somebody on the ass, or he, you know, tried to grab somebody's pussy, or he exposed mm. himself, or anything terribly egregious. Um, he didn't, he, you know, he didn't do it. Uh, and he's, you know, uh, in the old days, prior to the the sensitivity that's going on in which we've become so sensitive that we're sensitive to a situation. We don't put, e- we don't give certain weight to each given situation based on the weight of that situation. It's one size fits all. Oh, he made a remark about he got four erections by seeing uh, uh, Jennifer, Lo- was it Jennifer Hudson or was it Lopez? I can't even remember. Yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, a few years uh, a, a, a few years ago, uh, somebody would have gone, "Oh, well, that's not, that's not proper." Okay, but today it's, "Oh, we got to give them, put them on leave." In the yeah. in, in a few years ago, a situation like this would have been handled, and this one should have been handled this way too. <coughs> said he should have been called in by HR and said, "You should know better. You're an executive with this company. Uh, you shouldn't be making these kinds of remarks." But I don't think there was anybody hurt by these remarks, okay? Uh, there wasn't any damage done by these remarks, but he's getting the, he, he, he's probably going to wind up getting the same penalty as, as Weinstein, you know? Well, I hope not. And, and, and if I could just make one, one other thing, I know we just, I just, just tried to. Hi, Jeff. Yeah, but go ahead. Hi, Jeff. Um, but uh, I know you're not a big fan of NPR, but there is a program that I've been listening to called Hidden Brain, and uh, they had a really interesting program dealing with this. You know, you ask, where did this come from? You know, this, this Me Too bubble. Why, why is it happening now? And uh, the interesting thing, a part of it is because of Trump. I forget a big part of it, according to this this uh, this, uh, this program, is because of Trump. It actually, sort of ironically, it 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 it, it connects Trump to the to the fall of the Berlin Wall. So basically, <laughs> I know that sounds odd, uh, but basically, you know, during during communist, you know, East, Eastern European, co- you know, uh, East German communism. Mm-hmm. You know, people didn't talk about the the repression. They knew it, but nobody talked about it. And then suddenly, the wall came down, and everybody was talking about it. And so, what's the connection with Trump, uh, or actually Weinstein, Weinstein and Trump? When women across the country were seeing Trump getting away with what what he was getting away with. They responded by lashing out at their own abusers. They couldn't get Trump, but they could get back at the person who abused them. And and just just an interesting point. Yeah, you know that uh, that uh, uh, what's his name, um, Seth MacFarlane. Yeah, his joke at an award show. Um, congratulations, the nominees. You know, no now no longer have to pretend that you're attracted to Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, yeah. Everybody in the audience laughed. They knew the joke. Well, okay. I mean, everybody... But nobody, but nobody talked about it. You know, my friend, my friend, my friend Shecky, who I, who I sometimes mention, 
uh, said to me when this whole thing started to happen, he said, look, who am I? He said, I mean, I worked on the Letterman show, but I'm not out in Hollywood. And even I knew what Harvey Weinstein was doing. Everybody in Hollywood knew about okay, Harvey. But I didn't know. I didn't know well, because I'm not on the inside. In fact, okay? I'm surprised. I'm surprised that any woman would go up to his, his apartment because, it, it, you know, the stories ran rampant. If you, if you were going to go see Harvey, you were invited to come to Harvey's hotel room. Okay. Everybody around you would say, don't go or expect this if you go. Because that was just a given, all right? This has been going on for years. And why is it that everybody waited until now to get a hissy fit well, about it? It was terrible was saying, then, it was terrible as now. I was saying, as I was saying, when they saw this happening to Trump, then that was sort of like the last straw. Yeah, but the fact the is... The psychological last straw. Yeah, but with Trump, tell me how he's had to suffer... For all the times he's been inappropriate with women, and from what we understand, there are at least 19 of them lined up ready to sue him when he isn't and president. He hasn't, <laughs> he hasn't suffered yet. But as I say, these other women are are responding with, with the person who attacked them directly because they, they have some power in that situation. Yeah. So anyway, I, I would just say I, I would suggest you can listen to it on a podcast. You know, what's I, it called? What's it, what it called? what's it called? It's called Hidden Brain. Hidden Brain. Okay. And they actually ha it's on the Me Too movement. Hello, oh, Jeff. Hello, no, Jeff. Yeah, I just want to say hello to Jeff. Yeah. Hello, you doing? Okay, I'm gonna shut up. No, that's okay. <laughs> Please. <laughs> we got up. plenty of room for both of you guys to talk because nobody's yeah, calling guess. tonight. I don't know what the pro I must have bad yeah. breath tonight or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, the YouTube thing I, I kind of uh, messed me up for a while. I, w I wasn't quite sure where I should be going, and um, and then I went back to uh, Skype, and I came right out here. So. Yeah, well, you go to you go to Gab. I don't know if other people are doing. You that. go to gabnet.net, and it's there. It's yeah. uh, it, you know that's the one place it will always be. Let me see. Is it running? Yep, there it is. There, yeah. there are the two of you, both uh, looking handsome as ever. Um, anyway, uh, let me uh, let me put the Gabnet live up there as long as there's room. Uh, let me see here. Um, so, I mean, we we you know we, we we you know as I say with Vinny, uh, I hope uh, they say you know we'll give you a slap on the wrist and go back to work and don't ever do it again. Mm -hmm. But it's not like he, you know, he came on to women or he did stuff like that. You know, he just made comments. He said he made homophobic comments as well. I, I have no idea what they would be, but I think Vinny felt he was being funny. You know? Mm -hmm. Well, I knew in the old days, if it was a woman, she would get fired. Mm -hmm. Just... Just for complaining. So just for complaining. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I just hate. Uh, I just think that women should have justice. A person like the, like uh, Dr. Ford should have justice. But, I mean, we have to give equal justice to Brett Kavanaugh. And let me explain what I'm saying, because I'm not a fan of Brett Kavanaugh's, and I think uh, personally, I think he's guilty as hell. All right. Yeah, and the other thing is, this is not a trial. It's this not a trial. It's a job interview. It's a <laughs> it is a job interview. Uh, but the point is that. Uh, and he failed. Huh? He failed. <laughs> and he failed. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, we're going to have to send you a rejection letter. Uh, uh, it, the fact was that um, uh, we, we can't have the balance just because you want to believe women more doesn't mean you believe men less. In other words, what you do is you give equality to people's claims and people's protestations of, uh, of, of non-guilt. Uh, we, we have to be even-handed about this, but what we've done is we've swung the pendulum the entire other way. If a woman says that a guy uh, uh, molested her or groped her or patted her on the ass mm. or did something, 
uh, it's his job to prove he didn't, you know, rather than uh, 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 somebody saying, well, let's, let's get to the bottom of this. Instead, a guy's life is ruined. Uh, and I, I find that kind of, I, I, I don't want to go the other way either. I'd like it to come to the middle where it should be and be a firm, even ground where a woman mm -hmm. feels confident she can make a claim. But, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you're also talking about, and I hate to bring this up because this sounds, this might sound sexist to some, but it, 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 what we're talking about is there's also affairs of the heart involved. In, uh, in some of this, not in a g woman who doesn't want the affections of a guy and he forces himself on her, but that you do have romantic situations in which maybe the woman might get mad at the guy and she'll, she then starts making claims about him, uh, uh, unwarranted. And even though they're unwarranted, today they're given 100% weight, and that's the problem, you know? I, I don't want to see people trying to get even with somebody suddenly getting an upper hand either. But I don't want to see guys who are acting, acting untoward in a, in a, towards a female to get away with that either. So how do we find that balance? How do we create that balance? Yeah, as I say, I, I, I think the, the answer is, is probably in restorative justice and recognizing that all these things are not equivalent. Um, you know, I was thinking of like a situation like John Lasseter, yeah. uh, you know, who just loved to hug people, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, and he just somehow he didn't. John know Lasseter that. was the head of was the, one of the heads of Disney and he was the head of Disney animation, created Pixar uh, mm -hmm. and is, again, another lovely man. You know, I have a copy of Monsters, Inc. over here that he signed. Not because I was at some signing somewhere. He and a bunch of people at Pixar all got together and 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 signed it, including John Lasseter. Uh, but Lasseter was uh, the brains behind the company, and mm -hmm. uh, you know what happened to him because he liked hugging people. He was a huggy, feely, touchy, yeah. you know. And uh, where, where where do we? How do we create the equality? that makes the truth come out, you know? How do we make it so that uh, a bunch of Republicans don't feel confident, uh, don't feel they can get away with claiming, oh, well, Dr. Ford uh, just wanted to get even with Brett Kavanaugh for one mm -hmm. reason or another. And the reason they can make those claims, because there have been some false claims. And women who yeah. make false claims, I, I, I think, should be very ashamed of themselves because they're not only hurting some guy's life, but they're also hurting the Me Too movement because when it's found out, it diminishes the, uh, the credibility of Me Too. Mm -hmm. Sure. sure. Uh, of, of course. Uh, yes, Jeff. Yeah, I heard something uh, yesterday that was... Uh, Pretty interesting for, from my perspective, um, and, and it was just the data. I mean, sometimes the data tells you a lot, uh, and you, you think about things somewhat mm -hmm. emotionally. Yeah. But sometimes when you see the numbers, yeah, it goes, you know, this is different than than I would think. Okay. Yeah. And and it was that that they were saying that of the people who are so-called Trump um, uh, Republicans, okay, and mm -hmm. Trump fans, we'll call them. Uh, yeah. If they found that tomorrow morning, mm -hmm. and it said, you know what, the judge did exactly what everybody, what what uh, the doctor said he mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. And 50% of the people would say, okay, let's give him the job. <laughs> well, what are you going to, you really got to consider that. Because I talk to a lot of what I call friends, <laughs> limited friends. Uh, and, and people have different perspectives on this whole thing. 
And I said, you know, forget about whether you know what reality is, but if if this is what happened, what would you do? Yeah, yeah you're Where? you're rattling your microphone. Where is it? Is it on? Right here. Right there. Then what's rattling? Yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm in my Apple. Uh, let's see. Maybe this is bugging. You know, it might be. Do you have a microphone in your earphones? No. 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 Oh, that that whatever whatever you did, whatever you touched here. I think I know what it is. What is it? <clears throat> the wire, which is the charge. I usually go this side. No, oh, I see. And I had to go around yeah. here because I'm in my sister-in-law's house. Okay, so. don't move too much. No. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, here, uh, one of the things that bothered me about Trump last night, and it wasn't just his so-called impression of Dr. Mm. Ford, but it was also this insinuation that the Democrats have ruined a man's life, okay, mm -hmm. and have hurt Dr. Ford. I wish well, Dr. Hey, Ford would come that, forward and say, okay. hey, okay. You know, the Democrats haven't hurt me. Brett Kavanaugh hurt me. You know? I mean, he's, he, he's trying to sound like he's you know, understanding of a woman's problems and something like this by say by by including her in the in in the whole uh, what the Democrats have done. They've hurt Dr. Ford as much as they've hurt Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah. Well, I heard uh, uh, people like Mitch McConnell and Grassley saying that the that that she was being victimized by yeah. the Democrats. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That that they were using her. You know, uh, and that, that she was a so she was victimized by them, not by Kavanaugh, by Republicans. Yeah. Um, well, let me let me see. Don't move around so much, Jeff. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's making all kinds of noise. I, I don't understand why the microphone cord would be doing that. But anyway, let me bring up something here. Here are a couple of uh, tweets that were put out by the Senate Judiciary, which had to be Grassley. It says, as part of Judge Kavanaugh's nomination to SCOTUS, the uh, FBI conducted its sixth full-field background investigation of Judge Kavanaugh since 1993. As part of the six prior FBI investigations, the FBI interviewed nearly 150 people who know Judge Kavanaugh personally. Nowhere in any of these six FBI reports, which the committee has reviewed on a bipartisan basis, was there ever a whiff of any issue at all related in any way to inappropriate sexual behavior or alcohol abuse. Okay? That was the Senate Judiciary Committee's tweet. Probably, I guess, it would have to have been okayed by Grassley. You have to fix something over there. Okay. Now, listen to this. Democrats of the Senate Judiciary Committee accused their Republican colleagues of mishandling confidential information contained in Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh's post-FBI background checks on Wednesday and alluded that the files may contain evidence of inappropriate sexual behavior and alcohol abuse. In other words, these so-called vaunted FBI um, uh, investigations into Brett Kavanaugh have found some stuff that isn't so good. The eight lawmakers indicated that statement was false and called on Grassley to issue an immediate correction. While we are limited in what we can say about this background investigation in a public setting, we are compelled to state for the record that there is information in the second post that was not accurate, the Democrats wrote. It was troubling that the committee majority has characterized the information from Judge Kavanaugh's confidential background investigation on Twitter as that information is confidential and not subject to public release. Senators Coons and Amy Kolbuchar did not join their colleagues in signing the document, although it's unclear why. 
Uh, basically, what they're saying is that what is contained in that those FBI files is far more indicative of alcohol use and sexual behavior than they're letting on. So, just a question. Um, well, you know, I've been gone a lot of the afternoon. Uh, to my knowledge, the uh, FBI report has not been released yet, correct? The newest FBI report. They're talking about the previous, you know, how they keep yeah, saying no, he, the, six the, times he was investigated by the FBI and he was found to be just, you know, clean as clean can be. And it turns out now that's not what those FBI reports said, but they're confidential and only for the eyes yeah. of the people who are on the committee. Right, yeah. And so one of the controversies over the report that's expected out at any time is that it is also going to be confidential and only going to be uh, be able to be seen by the senators themselves. So um, I, I don't know. Uh, will we be able to find out what, what was in those other reports? And why were these uh, previous, if it is true, that they had noticed, uh, you know, situations with him drinking to the point of blacking out and stuff, that they didn't think this was important enough previously. So obviously... Well, I mean, it obviously uh, supposedly alluded, it, it was the letter they wrote, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing here because it's kind of long, uh, but basically... Uh, um, uh, each of us reviewed the confidential background investigation of Judge Kavanaugh before the hearing. While we're limited in what we can say about this background investigation in a public setting, we're compelled to state for the record that there is information in the second post that is not accurate. We urge you to ensure these Twitter posts are promptly corrected. It's troubling that the committee majority has characterized information from Judge Kavanaugh's confidential background investigation on Twitter as that information is confidential, not subject to public release. If the committee majority is going to violate the confidentiality and characterize this background investigation publicly, you must at least be honest about it. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. this is not the first instance of committee majority staff mischaracterizing or selectively disclosing information regarding the allegations of sexual misconduct by Judge Kavanaugh. While Republican senators have falsely claimed without evidence that committee minority staff leaked Dr. Ford's letter alleging that Judge Kavanaugh had sexually assaulted her committee, majority staff have publicly claimed that you possess evidence undermining the allegations while only selectively disclosing that evidence. So, you know, there's a big pissing match going on here. Oh, yes, of course. And getting worse the fact that that you know this this current investigation uh, is deeply flawed. They've hardly hmm. interviewed any of the of the witnesses. People have actually volunteered to speak to the FBI and have not been called back, uh, including and Dr. Ford. I mean, they've refused to talk to her. Says, well, we already got enough information. For well, her. where I find that incredulous is the fact that Dr. Ford probably has information they could use. Stuff mm -hmm. she says, for instance, she is willing to share with the FBI the notes of her psychiatric treatment uh, so that they can get a better picture of what went on. And mm -hmm. uh, she's willing to give them more names of people who might substantiate what she had to say. Stuff that she wasn't going to say in the hearing because unless she was asked it directly, they, they, she wasn't going to state it. Uh, she should be, she should definitely be interviewed, as should Kavanaugh. Right. You know? Yes, uh, Jeff. I, I tell you, look at it from my perspective. The whole FBA system mm -hmm. is basically Trump, tell, from my understanding, I believe, and I, I'm not, I don't have all, all the information, but this is what I believe, is that Trump just forces them what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. And because of that, they're pretty lousy to do this. Yeah, yeah oh, no, no question in my mind. 
No okay. question in my mind. So, you know, the, the whole system, whatever we're going to hear tomorrow, it doesn't mean anything to me. The one thing I do know, though, is the, our judge should be fired, should not be given that job. And, and it doesn't matter with any of the data that they're going to give us tomorrow. Whether it's positive or negative, it doesn't matter. The, well, guy, see, the, yeah. the guy does not have enough demeanor to handle people on that job. Well, I thought that his demeanor uh, at that hearing the other day uh, yeah. was abominable and was not the kind of attitude and kind of temperament I would want to see out of someone sitting in judgment of other people's lives. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, and and I I uh, was appalled by it. And all I'm thinking of is that why this rush to put him on the Supreme Court. Uh, if you have any doubts in this particular case, whether you're Republican or Democrat, and I'm sure those Republicans do have their doubts, okay? But they want this guy on the court because he's going to be their bitch. Uh, 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 if you have any doubt about the moral uh, moral qualities of a person or about anything, it, it, like I watched Saturday Night Live the other night. They had Matt Damon doing Brett Kavanaugh. And then in their newscast, half the newscast, uh, the comic newscast, was about Brett Kavanaugh and about the hearings. And Kavanaugh, in almost every case on this show, was portrayed as this cartoon character. Once that image of this guy is out there among the public, do you really want to put this guy on the Supreme Court? You know? Yeah. What is wrong with your with your earphone? Wait, wait, stand up. Stand, not... stand up a second. Let me see what that what's going on down there. Come on. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Let me see. Let me see here. Just, uh, uh, move, uh, just, this is uh, what I'm using here. Wait a minute. You know what that is? You know what that little black thing is there down in the bottom? Oh, 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 oh. Move, move over a little bit. Move over oh, a little bit. Little... Yeah, microphone. Yeah, you, yeah, you've got a microphone on there. Yeah, that's what it is. The thing you're holding right now, that little black thing towards the top. See on the uh, on the on your right hand side. See, there's a little black thing. That's your yeah. That's your microphone. Oh, it is. Yeah. How do you like that? Yeah. Yes. So somehow try to keep that from going against your uh, uh, your your shirt. That's what it's been okay. doing all night. Yeah. Let's try okay. one thing. Yeah. Yeah. How does it sound now. Huh? It sounds fine. Yeah. You sound fine. I can't hear it. Huh? Oh, you can't hear a thing. What? what you, I can hear it. Oh, okay. All right. Well, anyway. I uh, just took it off. Yeah. <laughs> I, the sound was starting to get to me, and I'm thinking, what? He's yeah. got to have it, you know, because like these, yeah. I have a microphone here, but I'm not using this as my as my microphone, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Well, plus, it's not touching your 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 clothing. Right. Yeah, and and it's probably picking up. It was like something. it was rubbing across your uh, your lapel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I apologize yeah. for that. Uh, uh, so I mean, I could never do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could, I, yeah. could I? Could I just interject sure. on that? Sort of yeah. on the same thought. Yeah. Alex. Um, and that is, especially given his rant against the Clintons and the Democrats, a very, very partisan rant. I mean, these these justices are going to be hearing issues like gerrymandering. And uh, and and can you imagine if I was taking a, a a reapportionment case to the Supreme Court? I say I don't want that judge hearing my case. I don't want that judge voting on my case. I already know that he's prejudiced against my side. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, th this is not a person of temperament. I mean, temperament is an important part of this job as well. Uh, and, you know, I mean, for instance, as an example, they say the Democrats are trying to stop this because they don't want to. 
Well, we never stood in the way of his last appointment. In fact, that went through very smoothly. Yeah. And had his hearing bar before the committee, and it went through. But mm -hmm. here there are some serious questions being asked about this guy. I mean, if he's going to show up every day drunk to the Supreme Court, we got a problem here. Well, I mean, I, I mean, he might, he might no longer have those drinking issues. But the fact that that he lied about he doesn't have drinking past. issues does he did he testify the other day like a guy who doesn't have a drink issue or a guy who might have actually been sober at that hearing well i i, I don't know but but i'm just saying that, that the that. fact that he was not honest about the past is the key here you know and which which sort of leads you to believe of well, what is he covering up? Yeah. And, and and what we're thinking about as far as cover up is, well, sexual assault. <laughs> if if he's if his binge drinking leads had actually led to to assaulting women like Dr. Ford, then we can see why he would want to cover that. Why are we afraid he's going to assault Ruth Bader Ginsburg? <laughs> well, I, as I said, you know, whatever's happened in the past, yeah. I mean, we can't. We can't make this assumptions Look, of what's going you know, on. you know, if this guy in the very beginning had said, yes, there was an incident like that, and it's something I deeply regret, it was something I did as a kid, and it was wrong of me, and to this very day I feel bad about it, uh, he, he would have, he they would have just glided him through, you know? And I would have even stood up for him because, hey, okay, you know the error of your ways. We've, we've all done things in the past we're embarrassed about. I certainly am. I, my, the, biggest <laughs> thing, the biggest thing I was embarrassed about in high school is I didn't get laid. You know, uh, I, I, I lost my virginity at like 19 or something like that. You know, I, had, I was out of high school by the time I lost my virginity. Well, I got you beat. I, I did until 21. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah, well, I thought it was going to last forever. Okay, I, I never figured I was going to get laid. Uh, <laughs> but I ultimately did, and then she got pregnant. So, you know, that was, I was off to a good start. <laughs> no, the question for me is, it, it, is it possible if it, uh, you go so long without sex, do you actually regain your virginity? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, well. <laughs> then I'm really in trouble. <laughs> you, you do regain your virginity as you get older. You know, um, so anyway. Oh, by the way, I went to the uh, the uh, uh, neurologist today, and now I'm on a new pill, which I tried once before, called gabapentin, which I haven't tried yet. But uh, it it seemed to make my feet worse. But I'm gonna try it. He says to give it a try. It, it supposedly kills nerve pain. So I'll see. The other stuff was. He said I gave you such a baby amount of that other drug, and I said yeah, but it just you know, it just, uh, amitriptyline, I said, I just didn't tolerate it well. I was, I got lightheaded, started sweating when I quit it, uh, you know. So anyway, we'll see what this one does. If it doesn't work, I found that my feet are not as bad, weren't as bad when I was in Vermont. I think maybe because the bed was different, a whole bunch of factors, but, uh, you know, they were still numb, but they weren't hurting. Anyway. So I went to the doctor. You were today. also walking around a lot more in Vermont. Yeah, yeah, that has a lot to do with it too. Anyway, I, I you know, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm giving up on this thing. I figure I'm just going to have numb feet for the rest of my life. He says I have a slight, maybe a slight amount of neuropathy in my right foot, and uh, as, uh, as for the rest of it, uh, he said, uh, you know, it could be the nerve in the spine and so forth, but. Enough of that. Uh, I got another story here for you. You're going to love this one. This is so Trump, I can't believe it. And it has nothing to do with Trump. Well, it does have something to do with Trump. The EPA, who's being run, it's being run by who? The person who hates the EPA? Well, see, we got a new guy, but he's for the coal industry. I forgot his name. Oh, yeah, they got rid of the old Trump one. Pruitt. Huh? They got uh, they got someone from the coal industry yeah. itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Environmental Protection Agency is rethinking its position on. Are you ready? Radiation. I heard that. 
It's been reported that the agency under Trump is exploring a rule change that experts say would weaken the way radiation exposure is regulated. The agency, the report says, is turning to scientific uh, outliers. What is that? I guess that's people outside the norm who argue that a bit of radiation damage is actually good for you. A little bit of sunlight. Uh, well, you know, as a person who has, actually has skin cancer, <laughs> yeah, I would tell, I would say, uh, uh, well, maybe a little bit of sunlight might be okay, or at least not damaging, but a lot of sunlight is not good. The government's and I current. Wish I had known that in the seventies. The government's current, decades-old guidance says that any exposure to harmful radiation is a cancer risk. The AP reports, and critics say the proposed change could lead to higher levels of exposure for workers at nuclear installations, oil and gas drilling sites, medical workers doing X-rays and CT scans, people living next door to super fun sites and any members of the public who one day might find themselves exposed to radiation disease. The report notes the Trump administration has already targeted various other regulations on toxins and pollutants, uh, such as coal power plant emissions and car exhaust, which the administration sees as costly and burdensome for business. Supporters of the EPA's proposal argue the government's current model that there is no safe level of radiation, the so-called no linear no-threshold model, forces unnecessary spending for handling exposure and accidents at nuclear plants and medical centers and other sites. What they're saying for the sake of business is, hey, a little bit of radiation couldn't hurt you. Comments? Yeah, <laughs> yeah a couple comments. Uh, one, uh, you know, your, your friend uh, Gwyneth Cravens, when oh, yeah. she wrote her book on nuclear power, noted that actually there is more radiation uh, emitted from coal, coal burning, yeah, from nuclear power plants, because there's actually uh, uranium in coal, so there's higher emissions from from coal plants. And the other thing that's sort of interesting is why are they even so concerned about about uh, the risk of of radiation from nuclear power plants when these levels are really, really extremely low already. Well, what I'm saying is, is that they're just, they're, radiation, they're, them uh, pass, you know, like, like, like granite buildings. Them passing the information that uh, doing this is not a, uh, uh, a real problem, you know. Yeah. Is uh, is not problematic, and saying that a little radiation won't hurt you. Well, I, I grant you, a little radiation won't hurt you. You get X-rays, and all those X-rays put Rentgens into your system, uh, and in most cases, uh, uh, in the amount of X-rays you have in your lifetime, are not going to give you any horrible cancer or anything. But the reason why your doctor uh, leaves the room and moves to New Jersey to click the button is because yeah. they don't want any radiation. And that whole room is lined with lead so that they can safely give you uh, a, uh, 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 an X-ray. Uh, they would get some kind of problems from that. Uh, but to pass the information along that, you know, the radiation, uh, uh, you know, it's, I, but it's it not so much that a little bit of radiation won't hurt you, what they're saying is a little bit of radiation might be good for you, like a bit of sun, like a bit of sunshine, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I think that that uh, what they're doing is actually going to, you know, is count, totally counterproductive. It's going to make any nuclear people even more irate. I mean, they're 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 being completely well, ridiculous. Well, listen, I mean. You know, I've always, as you know, uh, Tom, I've always been for nuclear power. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think certainly the alternative, which is coal power and uh, uh, anything else that spews toxins into mm -hmm. the air, is far more dangerous on a very realistic level than a well-contained nuclear reactor. Uh, you know, everybody points to uh, Chernobyl. Oh, look what happened at Chernobyl. Well, Chernobyl was an accident waiting to happen. 
That was an un, uh, what do they call, unconfined uh, nuclear plant. Uh, right. Yeah. It was. There was no contain. There was. Uh, no, it was no uncontained. There was no yeah. containment uh, right. vessel. Right. And it was. It was a very bad design. It, well, it was. Well, it was early on in nuclear power. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, they were Russians and poor at the time, and they built it on the cheap, and so. When it went, that was a very big disaster. But I always say, they say, well, what about Three Mile Island? And I go, what about Three Mile Island? They said, well, you had a, a nuclear problem there. I went, no, you didn't. We managed to contain it. We managed to prevent a nuclear disaster at Three Mile Island in spite of the fact that uh, it, we could have easily had one. But we contained it. And I said, that is proof positive that we know what we're doing. Yeah, you know, and and, and, and the, yeah, and one of those things that those two, those two had in common, was operator error. In fact, sixty minutes actually did a segment once a long time ago that said actually both crews that were involved were, were sleep deprived. That sleep deprivation uh, played into the mistakes that were made, that unfortunately caused not as much a. Uh, a medical or a health risk as just a, a, a complete economic disaster. I mean, it destroyed, <laughs> it basically did destroy well, it, uh, it, a whole utility in, in Pennsylvania. You, you know, but, I mean, the thing is that Three Mile Island didn't cause any real problems, and if it did cause any problems, certainly not as bad as, say, Love Canal or mm -hmm. what's going on in Detroit, you know, uh, uh, with their problems up there. Uh, with just bad sewage, you know, and bad uh, chemicals being dumped into the water. Uh, there are your real problems. But I think that the uh, a, a, that uh, a nuclear power as a, um, a, what do you call it, as a substitute for, you know, using what burns coal and puts a lot of toxins in the air, uh, I'm I'm for nuclear power. I just think it needs to be, you know, adequately uh, policed and run, and 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 that we be very careful with it. It's very dangerous. You yeah. know. Well, you, you remember when I brought my friend Karen on your. Pro this was when you were on in the daytime. Yeah. Uh, when you first went on, and if you were in the daytime, in fact, it was Patrick had actually uh, had was talking about his doubts about climate change. And uh, I said, oh, I've got a friend. She's a, a high school science teacher. She's been researching this. And you would especially like her because through all her research on climate change, she discovered that as a, you know, as a risk of, you know, nuclear power is a great, is a much better risk than, than fossil fuels that are, are going to overheat the planet. Right. So that's why I brought her on, and we had a really good discussion. Unfortunately, uh, Patrick is still <laughs> is still well. You know. you know, I'll tell you what I saw this weekend. I was in uh, I was in Vermont, and Vermont is a very progressive state in a lot of areas. Uh, in fact, I saw their lieutenant governor on television. He has a ponytail. Okay, does that speak Vermont for you? Um, Bernie Sanders. Leahy. Yeah. Leahy is from Vermont. Right, yeah. Uh, uh, people that we, you know, that we think of, we have good feelings about. Um, oh, the people I was staying with don't like Sanders at all. And they, they're right wing. They're, they're left wingers. They're not right wingers. But they hate him. They just say he's he's a phony. They know him personally. So I I said, look, I'll take your word for it. But you know, when he's out there speaking about stuff, he's speaking about the right stuff. So how can I fault him? You know, as 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 a person who, yeah. you know, listen to him. But I I understand he's probably a creep. All right, okay. I know he's a creep, but. Uh, when I was living in Vermont with my mother, adopted mother Alice in Burlington, yeah. um, her housemates uh, celebrated Bertie's uh, 40th birthday party in that house. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's yeah. A, you know we were right near Burlington. We were in Shelburne. Yeah, Shelburne. And we went yeah. into Burlington for a. I marched for leukemia. 
<laughs> you can believe that. <laughs> You'll see it tomorrow night on the on the tape. Um, okay. But the uh, 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 what I was going to say is a lot of uh, my my. Our friends who we were staying with are putting in solar panels on their house. Uh, it's a very beautiful house on the lake and so on. And I started seeing a lot of solar panels around Vermont as we were driving around. And they've gotten them to a science now where they actually look good on a building. You know, they don't look ugly. They kind of look almost artful in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, a lot of homes are getting themselves um, uh, solar power. Solar power has finally come into its own. It, there was a time when it wasn't very efficient, but now he says that with solar power, they'll be able to supply power, about 80% of the power they need to take care of their house, you know. And uh, you can sell some of it back, but not all of it. So you really don't want to put up more panel than you really need. But, right, right, but, right. But, but yeah, we have the same situation with pg e here. Yeah. They have a deal where you really can't sell back more power than you, than you use. Right. So, um, yeah. But, so anyway, it, it, it really, oddly enough, uh, it, it does a... Um, um, uh, uh, it, it does uh, it does work, and, and a lot of people are using it, and uh, that may be the answer to it all. Is it? Pe but you know, for you or I to put solar panels up in our house, if we had a house, it's a pretty expensive proposition. It's not cheap. You do get some rebates and things like that, but uh, still, it's very expensive. Very expensive. Yeah, my son works on uh, recommends it on certain buildings that he's developing. Mostly, uh, he works on commercial property. He's an architect, but they use it uh, wherever they can, you know? Yeah. It's a, but remember, this is a new building. That right. It's a lot easier and a lot cost-effective to do it then. Yeah, but uh, it... it um uh, it, 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 they've gotten to the point where they do put out enough power that you can power a house with it, you know. And uh, you, you go down to Silicon Valley, you look at the saucer that uh, Apple built, the entire top of that thing is nothing but solar panels. Now, I'm wondering how much of their electricity is being generated, it, it, you know, is it, how much... It's generating for the use of that building. I'm wondering yeah. if it's the eighty percent you get out of a household, or whether it's considerably less. Um, yeah. Well, Tim Cook on their last uh, presentation said that they were Apple was now running a hundred percent on on solar power or renewable power. So I don't know how that breaks down. Renewable. I, what does he mean by renewable? Is solar re solar well, is obviously renewable, re and also well, you're, you're talking about wind and hydro as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I don't see that he put up any windmills there. No, but but PG&E has has you know hydro much of a lot of PG&E's um, power comes from hydroelectric. Yeah. Uh, as well as they well they. Yeah, they, and they have geothermal, not as much, you know, a little bit of geothermal, and then the windmills. Yeah. Do you but, want? Do you want yeah. to know? Do you want to know one? Of the, I found this out. One of the biggest expenses in putting in solar. You, if you have solar, mm -hmm. you have to have storage batteries, because yeah, when it, or, you know, yeah, solar or, power doesn't say, "Hey, I'm just going to give you a, as much as you need." You know, you don't flip the switch and it sucks it out, out of the sun. No. The sun is always generating it and it has to go somewhere and it goes to a storage uh, uh, batteries, which then supply the house. Okay. Who makes, who is the number one producer of uh, storage batteries for solar? Uh, you mean a company? Yep. It's going to surprise you. But it's uh, not going to surprise you when I tell you because you're going to go, oh, yeah, sure. Why not? I'm going to guess. Yeah. GE. Nope. Any idea? 
You ready for this? Tesla. I was actually going to say that, but I says no. <laughs> T Tesla is the number one supplier of solar of so batteries to solar systems. Yeah, and it seems logical. After all, didn't they solve the uh, the you know the the battery problem? So you know, yeah. and that's actually what I wanted to bring up earlier was was the fact that that one of the one of the problems with going to solar and wind is the fact that they're intermittents, what they're called intermittents, that they're not available all the time. So what do you do when they're not available? And if that means that you're burning coal or natural gas, yeah. you know, that becomes an issue. But if with the increased uh, improvements in battery power, yeah, more efficient batteries, where you know companies obviously like Tesla and others are working on, um, you know, I mean that's 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 reason for for being optimistic. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it it really is. Uh, it really is. Uh, uh, interesting that, that uh, Tesla has found. You know, if you if you're thinking of investing in Tesla, uh, just remember they got other businesses going for them. <laughs> you know? uh, now, by the way, here you heard the thing about about Elon Musk. Oh yes. And the fact that the SEC said uh, his tweet was a no-no. Some people are referring it to uh, to it as the most expensive tweet of all time. Uh, he made this tweet, in case people don't know, that said that he was going to get, he was thinking of going private. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, is, he's, he seems to have found somebody that was willing to buy the shares for $420 a share. Well, the, the stock then went, I can't remember whether it went down or went up, but it, it did something. And the SEC didn't like this because he was just simply speculating. And it turns out that he wasn't thinking of going private. And there, the, the, he then started saying, well, I've got investors in Saudi Arabia and so on. Turned out he didn't have investors in Saudi Arabia. What nobody caught in all of this was the fact that maybe he was just making a joke. Because, uh, you know, you're talking about maybe a 420 joke? Yep. <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Four twenty. But, but anyway, he uh, said, "Okay, I'm sorry, I did that, and I shouldn't have done that." And they said, "Well, you got to step down as chairman of Tesla, yeah. and uh, you've got to give us twenty million dollars, and also Tesla has to give us twenty million dollars." So he paid it up, and he quit as chairman. But you know what? He's still CEO. <laughs> You know, I mean, they didn't tell him he had to stop being the CEO. Yeah. And as soon as they, as soon as he stepped down as chairman and paid the twenty million dollar fine, the stock went up again. So you know, but you got to be careful when you're when you're you know when you've got the uh, uh, people um, uh, investing in your company. Uh, you better not say things that are taken as being a way to make it go up or make it go down or make it go sideways. Musk, I think, is a little crazy, which is he's, good. Is good because he's, he's good crazy. You know, he's an interesting character. Yeah, but, I think I would like him better if he wasn't so anti-union. Is he anti-union? Oh, he's very anti-union. They've been trying to. The UAW has been trying to organize the Fremont plant. And he is just a complete obstacle. And yeah. Okay, yeah, let me he, ask you this yeah. question though. Do you know anybody that works at the plant? I bet people that work at the plant. Okay. That do, are trying to unionize do, it. Do they get paid well? Yeah. 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 But they're also concerned about the working conditions. They said it's very, very unsafe working conditions. Oh, there. really? And there a number of of serious injuries. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Because, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, the way in which people keep unions out is by paying good money. Oh, yeah. So the people no, don't want necessarily that. want a union, although those they, people don't realize the reason they're getting that good money is because a union does exist. Right, exactly. You know, 
-hmm. and and it isn't a question of. Uh, but it, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. Got one one other item here. Actually, I got a couple. But well, for instance, at Fox News. Uh, has a new slogan. Have you heard this new slogan? Um, opinions done right. Now, I guess that's not a lie. Opinions done right? Right, right as extreme. Oh, yeah. Just like they used to say about Barry Goldwater, in your heart you know he's right. And then put, yeah. and then say, put it on the bullboard. Yes, extreme right. <laughs> well, actually, it, it's a thing called Fox Nation subscription service. What is Fox Nation? But anyway, well, it, yeah. it, 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 uh, Fox News Channel this week took the wraps off a new slogan, Opinions Done Right. The slogan suggests the news service said to be aimed at Fox News superfans will emphasize the opinion programming that brings top ratings to them, although not as top as they used to. You know, uh, it seems like MSNBC, is it Rachel Maddow? I was beating out Hannity, I believe. Okay. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, I know what people do. Is. Anything more about the uh, separated children? You know, you know something? What happens is we have, as, as a nation and as, as, news, uh, as news people, uh, short attention spans. We always go chasing after the next shiny object. And right now the mm -hmm. shiny object is Brett Kavanaugh. And so we don't hear anything about these kids who have been stolen from the breasts of their mothers uh, mm -hmm. and uh, probably won't until somebody gets tired of Brett Kavanaugh and they have nothing else to talk about and they'll go back and say, well, what do we have sitting in the wings we can do again? Yeah, well, what it is is we're just on, on an assault on, on so many fronts. So much stuff is mm -hmm. going on. It's just impossible to keep up with it all. You know, I mean, it's just like. But I think I think it's also I'm going to reunite these families, and mm -hmm. they get they get these kids up in the middle of the night and pull them out to it's like tents in a desert. Yeah, but it's the thing easy. is, the thing is, you got to get these news operations to cover the story, and they don't cover the story. Uh, uh, they're tired of that story. They got a new one. They got a new thing they can gin up. Yeah, the other thing is, there's a certain geometry that's a problem. Uh, that all of these kids are in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Who wants to go hang out in the middle of a, a desert? But I mean, a, you're a right. That, place. That, that and, 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 I, I'm sure that story. They're wondering, and they're wondering why why nobody's coming to claim them. It's because the people, the, the, the guardians that, that could potentially claim them, are worried about getting deported themselves. If they step forward and, 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 and say, yeah, I'll take care of this kid. If they're not documented, they're they're deported too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? What we need to what they what, what, if the president were decent, what he would do is he would uh, come out with an amnesty situation in which if you want to claim your kid, we won't throw you out of the country. We'll find a way to keep you here. But far yeah. be it from him for to do that. You know? No, no. He's got his little thirty percent the next. Uh, President. And by the way, just one last thought, because we're running out of time here. Uh, this whole thing about uh, uh, what was the latest thing that he came up with? Um, uh, oh, boy. Oh, yeah. oh boy. What was it? The other day, he came up with a new trade agreement or something like that. Oh, I know what it was. Iran. Was it Iran? What was I thinking? It was mostly about NAFTA. Canada. Oh, NAFTA. NAFTA. That's what it was. Yeah, they're NAFTA. not calling it NAFTA, but it's obviously yeah. NAFTA. Do you know that whole NAFTA plan that he has uh, suddenly signed was on his desk the day he came into office, and it was left there by the Obama administration? <laughs> and he's taking claim for it. See? I kept my promise. I did away with NAFTA, and it's now going to be a whole new thing. That was a proposal by the Obama administration that he finally signed. Yeah. Anyway, hey, listen, you know something? It's just the, the three of us, and it's been just a really nice show, you know? We've really had a nice discussion, uh, meaning we don't need nobody, 
Okay, so the rest of you didn't call tonight. Fuck you. Uh, isn't that isn't that nice of me? Uh, hey, maybe you want to uh, maybe do a little wave goodbye to everybody, and uh, that's our citizen panel and a good one tonight. Uh, we had an enjoyable time. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Let me uh, get rid of them and uh, leave the get the lines open for Jack Bishop, who I hope gets more calls than I did. He's coming up next over most of the same station uh, 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 with the intersection at uh, 1 o'clock this morning, Eastern Daylight Time, Connections. And tomorrow night at 9.30, it's Damian Chaplin and The Exchange. I'll be here tomorrow night, 10 o'clock, maybe. I don't know. After tonight with nobody calling, I may just say fuck it. But we'll, maybe we'll try it again tomorrow night, uh, 10 o'clock. Same time, same station in life. In the meantime, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Good night, everybody.